welcome everyone to another episode of Keto Chat. I am your host, Carol Freeman, certified nutritionist, clinical hypnotherapist, uh, blah, 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 letters and stuff like that. Um, I am so excited today. I do that every time. Like, I'm always excited, right? Like, if I ever had a guest where I'm like, man, I'm kind of mediocre or excited about this person. But uh, Dr. John Lemansky, um, I met him on Low Carb Cruise a couple weeks ago, and we got to hang out. And, and we got to eat dinner together pretty much every night. And so I'm so excited to have him on today. Well, let me just read his official bio. So those of you that don't know who he is, you can know why I'm so excited. Um, so Dr. John Lemansky is a board certified physician in internal medicine. He has worked as a hospital medicine physician for a decade and saw firsthand the destruction caused by modern Western diet and lifestyle. His desire to improve health and longevity for his, for his patients and society led him creating his own virtual practice based in San Francisco, California. Dr. Lemansky incorporates biohacking techniques within a ketogenic lifestyle to improve health at a cellular level. He currently is the co-host of the Keto Hacking MD podcast with veteran podcaster Jimmy Moore. And you can find him all over social media at John Lemansky MD. We'll link it all below in the show notes too. And his website, drjohnlemanskymd.com. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Lemansky. You're calling me Dr. Lemansky? Come on. What's going on? <laughs> well, We're like family. You got to call me Dr. John or hey, you. Hey, 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 yo, John. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I picked that up. Like I started paying attention to the whole like, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Thing. <laughs> Is that a totally inside joke that's going yes. over in your head? But, so, well, no, it was really interesting though because at the, on the cruise, we got to eat dinner every night and I hung out with you and Dr. Ken Barry. And then in our little friend group that was hanging out, we'd always say Dr. Barry, and then we would call you Lemansky. And it was, we, so we talked about like why it was that, that we didn't call you jo Dr. John or John. Yeah, and I'm kind of pissed now. <laughs> it was just because like John is such a common name that people right. be like John who but we so we we all called you Lemansky uh because that was like oh well, we know who we're talking about then so yeah there's not that many Lemanskys out there so it's pretty pretty unique yeah, yeah so it's just like you know how bros call each other by their last name so you were you were okay. Lemansky does so <laughs> very cool I like it yeah so anyways welcome and uh, oh my gosh I'm sure we're gonna have lots of great stuff to talk about one of the topics I want to pick your brain on is is fasting. Um, so you inspired one of the people hanging out in our group, um, Mike Berta, to do his first fast. And, uh, and Go Mike. Uh, yeah, he's doing really great with that. So when we're talking about fasting, like how to use that therapeutically, um, you know, what results and all that kind of stuff. So let, let's just start with that because there's a lot of topics. Okay. We can cover, but let's, sure. How did you, how did, well, okay, never mind. <laughs> I'm just going to be all over the place here. First, we got to get your backstory. We got to start out like, how did okay. you, become you i just started fasting end of story <laughs> done you were born fasted and then this was a fasted. very quick podcast uh, done i just Are fasted breathitarians <laughs> yeah yeah no those people scare me no um yeah so i mean a little bit in my story you know i um trained as a regular internal medicine physician and um you know as most physicians i thought i knew kind of what i was talking about and um I tell a story where I was pretty athletic all my life. And so weight for me was never an issue. I was always thought I was healthy. Um, you know, as you get older, you figure, well, getting older and I wasn't that old, but I was getting tired and I figured, well, it's probably because, you know, I'm a medical student. I got to study all the time, but we had to do some lab work and um, as part of an experiment. And my lab work showed that I was actually, you know, pre-diabetic and starting to have insulin resistance which freaked me out because at the time I thought I was eating really healthy. I was mostly veg, you know, not vegetarian, but I would have a little bit of fish, but no fat whatsoever. So I was basically following the guidelines that we were teaching people about. And so that really freaked me out because I was exercising a lot, you know, weight wasn't an issue. And so I started really looking into, you know, how could this be? Is it a genetic thing? Is it something else that I'm doing that's wrong? And, and, as I started learning more and more about nutrition, because it is true in medical school, we don't learn about nutrition. You know, we learn about biochemistry. So I could, you know, recite for you all the pathways that go into the actual process of breaking down glu into glucose. I could tell you all that, but in terms of the macronutrients and micronutrients, we don't really focus on that. Um, and so I had to start doing it on my own and started learning. And so initially it started for me. I mean, I was worried about myself. And then as I started reading more about it, 
you know, I started reading some of the Weston Price information that was out there. And you got to remember, you know, the internet was very different um, 12, 13, 14 years ago now, where there wasn't a ton of information like there is now, right? So it was mostly going into the textbooks, going back into books that were available um, and kind of learning as I went. Um, but what I did realize was that as I started implementing some of the more ketogenic practices, you know, I repeated my labs and my labs were getting better. And so that was a very, very, you know, positive reinforcement for me where, you know, all of a sudden now things were looking better. And then it's kind of gradually since then, I mean, you know, I'm one of those people that I always want to learn. So I feel like in medicine and life and anything that you do in life, if you remain stagnant, you're, you know, you're going backwards. You're not actually learning anything. And so I'm sure, you know, like you, like a lot of people in this community, we read, we learn, we watch podcasts, you know, we watch videos. We are constantly learning to try to keep up with the amount of information that we're learning about, right? And so it's been a very, very long process, but I've gotten to a point where I feel like I know a lot about nutrition um, and about medicine in general. So that's yeah. kind of the backstory, yeah. Isn't it a fun time to be involved in this? Because it's pretty much everything we thought we knew, like is <laughs> not to be a 180. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, you see more doctors talking about historically what we used to do as physicians and how now, now when you look back, you're like, okay, how could you conceptually think that that was something that we should do? Well, I mean, same thing is still happening. We're doing things that we think conceptually are, are good for people. And then we learn, no, actually, this is probably wrong. The question is, do you have it in you to actually look at the data and say, you know what, that's probably wrong. We should probably be doing what the data is kind of telling us is right. And then you have stories where people are dramatically improving their lives, right? Based on what they're doing from a nutrition standpoint, not medications, not surgeries, but just nutrition and lifestyle modifications. And I mean, I have thousands of people who send me their stories and it's, it's you know, unbelievable the transformations that people are having. It's like liberating. I mean, people are coming off medications that they don't need. Um, so yeah, it's a very exciting time to be part of all this. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, but it's still very fringe, right? It's, uh, you, you know, it works because you've seen the transformations, mm. you've heard the stories and still, we're still thought to be like telling people to do this crazy, unhealthy thing. Yeah, it is. It's still fringe, but I will say that as in everything else that you see with social media and how you can magnify one thing and make it really kind of resonate with, with everybody, right? Mm. It becomes viral. And I think, the benefit of social media and, you know, like you and I wouldn't have met, right, is that we learn from each other, we learn from each other's experiences, and then we can get the information out there. You know, people like Dave Feldman, like Ted Naiman, you know, Ivor Cummins, like these guys who are not in the medical profession, well, I guess Ted is, but the other guys who are not in the medical professions, you know, 20 years ago, we wouldn't listen to anything they had to say. Right. And so we would be losing that tremendous amount of information that actually, no, I'm looking to these guys and saying, okay, tell me what you think about this because you're approaching it from a different perspective. You don't have a vested interest and I want to learn from you. And if we can do that as a you know, society, we all benefit from it. And I, that's part of what I'm really trying to strive for. Yeah, that's, that's so great. And that you're, you've got to know you're a unique doctor that you have that kind of perspective. Um, yeah. Why is it that, that so many doctors just practice from a place of, I learned what I learned and, and, and that's all there is to know and they just dust their hands off of learning anything new? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think there's a couple reasons. Um, I don't unless you've been through it, it's probably like akin to going and being a Navy SEAL. Unless you've been through it where you have spent, you know, 15 hours a day learning material that's so dense, so comprehensive. Once you get through that, you kind of just instinctually think, oh, I know it all, right? I mean, it's just like human nature. Mm -hmm. And I think if you get to that point where you think you know it all, you will be humbled. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, an average physician is working 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week, 100 hours a week, seeing patients, you know, working from eight to eight, doing charts at home on the weekends, has a family. 
when is he or she really going to be able to sit down and be like, hmm, let me, let me look into this. Some people make it a priority. You know, for me, it's a priority um, and I incorporate it into my family. So we are always talking, learning about it. But I think for a lot of people, it's, hey, like I'm a doctor, I know what I'm talking about and this is what I've been told. The other thing is, you know, we have to practice by standard of care, by guidelines that are made by big institutions. And if you step outside of that, then you become, you know, you have a liability attached to you. And so I think a lot of people are risk averse where they don't actually want to put their heads out there. Um, then on the flip side, you got guys like, you know, Dr. Barry, who are like, no, this is the information that needs to get out there because what we're telling people is wrong and it's hurting us as a society. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of reasons, individual reasons why people, you know, are not stepping up. But what I have noticed is that there's a lot more doctors coming out saying, you know what? this is what we need to do. We need to change the, the paradigm. And, and so the more that I see coming out, I think the more we're going to be able to change kind of where we're going as a society. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots I'm, a, I'm an optimist, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's great. I was thinking of uh, more of those of us that are just love learning that we can't understand other people that don't always love learning as well. Um, yeah. But you brought up some really great points that are probably all true. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like, let's say just in the keto community, we're probably hitting 4% of the population, right? And so, you know, it's the same thing like any, anything else in life. We're now surrounding ourselves with people who think the same way that we do. So we assume that everybody else thinks the same way that we do. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is, you know, a lot of people either are, you know, don't have the information or are being scared and told that, well, this is actually quite dangerous. And so if you've been told something for 50 years of your life and all of a sudden people are starting to say, well, no, that's all wrong. You should do this. A lot of people are going to be skeptical because how many fad diets have been put out there? I mean, I'm going to be 40. I can tell you at least 10, 10 to 15 fad diets that were the next end all be all diet that everybody should do. And turns out, uh, yeah, no, that wasn't right. So I can understand why other people are skeptical about low carb or keto. I'm not because I've seen the impact that it's done on people. You, I'm sure, are not because of your own personal experience and your experience with people. But that's not everybody's story right now. Right, right. Well, and uh, Dr. Ken, Dr. Barry, had a, a fun way that he, um, you remember his story where he said that uh, he loves to, um, you know, anytime he gets in an Uber, a taxi, or <laughs> has a waiter or waitress at a restaurant, he pulls yep. up some random thing on his phone and he goes, have you heard of this keto diet? And that's his litmus test to know like when it's hit the critical mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once the Uber drivers and the waitresses know, um, then, then we're done. Right. And so, but he yeah. lives in Tennessee where he's going to have a different population. So typically things move like it hits East coast first, then West coast. No, then no, no. West coast. Come on. How can you do that? West Coast. West Coast, yeah. uh, East Coast, and then it hits the middle. So interestingly, right. so the applications I have right now coming in for most of the people that want to work with me are all from Texas. So that's nice. a good sign that we're hitting the middle, and then it spreads yep. out from there. And so funny, funny thing that I need to tell Dr. Barry, though, is that um, a, a few days ago, I'm riding in an Uber over to Seattle, and whatever the conversation with the the guy that i'm with we're talking about keto or whatever we're talking about the conference and right. the, the driver goes hey have you guys heard of keto like the uber driver actually says it to me <laughs> nice. and it like starts this was awful because i you know I, my backstory is that i was in a car accident because somebody was distracted he turned around and started talking to you pulls up his facebook and starts scrolling through <laughs> all the facebook posts and i'm like ah stop no. it don't do that yeah <laughs> that's great no. stop it yeah and, yeah, then, I, and then the bartender last night as well, she had to do a report for her, her college project on watching the Magic Pill movie, which was a keto movie. Nice, nice. And so then I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm, I went there for a comedy thing, and, uh, and she, she um, so she starts saying, talking about this keto thing and how it's not, you know, it's the, the movie's like skewed for all this stuff. And I, I kind of said, yeah, I, I know a little bit about that or whatever. And then she... She asked a little more and then she goes, okay, so I kind of think, are you, are you keto Carol? <laughs> Cause when I was doing my research for my project, like you came up on the first page and I've You're seen famous. you in there and I kind of think I know you. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's, 
that's me. So it's, it's, it's spreading, right? So it's college projects, but still this is West Coast. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, definitely it's West Coast, then East Coast, sorry, East Coasters. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I travel in the middle of the country. So I've, you know, traveled in Louisiana, Mississippi, and every time I come back to see people, more people are talking about it. So yeah. if we can hit, you know, populations like that, then we're making a big difference. And it's, it's really going to be not you and me necessarily telling people like, this is what you got to do. It's going to be, you know, people in middle America who like see their neighbor or their cousin or their wife. And they're like, wow, not only are you losing a ton of weight, because we still use weight as like our end all be all marker mm -hmm. of success, but you feel good. Your joints don't hurt. You're dropping your medications. You know, you're not hungry all the time. Like those things I think are, are going to be more powerful. Obviously, you know, us getting the information out there and telling people the science behind it is very important. But I, I think it's just the visualization of people saying, look, you know, my neighbor lost 80 pounds and I hear that all day long. We lost 200 pounds. Like, dude, that's amazing. And uh, that's, that's what really sells people on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's still the thing that motivates people the most to give it a try. And then once they start feeling so great, mm -hmm. then they, and discover how delicious the food is, then they can stick, then they stick with it. So, yeah. I mean, that's the best, it's the best of all worlds. So, okay. So that we, we talked about how you kind of got into this. So what, um, let's talk about how you got on the fasting train. Like that's one of your yeah. go -to, um, biohacks that you do, you know, I imagine with your, your patients and with yourself. So let's talk about that. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, my thing is that the way that we're set up in our Western society is that, you know, nutrition obviously plays a huge part of everything that we're talking about. If you don't do that, you might as well not worry about all the other biohacks. But once you've kind of dialed that down to what works, you got to really start addressing other things. And that means like sleep, stress reduction, exercise, all the other things that we kind of take for granted, right? So a lot of people will come to me and say, look, I've hit a plateau, you know, I'm doing all my macros. And they, they do not understand that there's a difference between being in ketosis and losing weight, mm -hmm. right? And so you can be in ketosis drinking, you know, 3,000 calories, 90% fat, and still not lose weight, right? Because your BMR has been damaged from years of, of cycling through fat diet. So your, your metabolic rate is low. So calories, like the, the idea that calories in equals calories out is not necessarily true because calories affect you differently hormonally, but you still can't go out and eat like, you know, a thousand or 10,000 calories of fat and expect that you're going to lose weight. You could be in ketosis, but you're not going to lose weight. And so a lot of times one simple solution to that when you hit a plateau is to do a fast. So whether it's, you know, 12 hour fast, 24 hour fast, five day fast, because what you're doing is you're really starting to activate your own body's uh, fatty acid or fat stores and using those preferentially for energy. And I think for a lot of people, it helps them get to that next level where they break through that plateau. For me personally, I kind of got into fasting more in terms of intermittent fasting because of the research, the benefits, but also because I felt a lot better. I felt more energetic. And I've realized that for myself and a lot of people that I work with, I could be in, in a longer state of intermittent fasting. So I'm in ketosis. And then when I eat, I can liberalize a little bit more of my carbohydrates. So I have a more balanced meal instead of just being like, okay, I'm going to drink coffee with MCT oil all day and be in ketosis, but not be able to eat real food because I, I like the taste of real food. Then, so that's like short-term fasting, but you know, I'm getting older and I'm interested in being healthy. I have three little kids. I want to make sure that when they're older, that I'm healthy enough as a grandparent that, you know, I live a long time and that when I live a long time, I feel really good. And so that's when the longer term fasting really comes into play because, you know, I want to make sure that I'm recycling through my immune system to create healthier, better immune systems. I want to make sure that my cells, my mitochondria, which are really what drive energy production are regenerated and made better. And so all the biohacking techniques really focus on that cellular level. And so that's why, you know, I'm not uh, criticizing free people from looking at weight as their goal and their marker of success. 
but I don't look at weight as the marker of success. I look at, you know, specific labs that look at inflammatory markers and how the cells are actually doing. Because to me, once you do that, the weight comes off. And so if you have an area where you're struggling or you're worried more about, you know, longevity, cancer, autoimmune diseases, doing extended fast can actually benefit you tremendously. And the research is really starting to come out showing what a tremendous benefit that is. So that's kind of a short abridged version of how I got into it. Okay. And so do you kind of have like across the board recommendations for fasting or is it just completely individualized? Yeah. So I always start with people who shouldn't fast, right? Because okay. all of a sudden people are going to be like, oh, I'm going to fast. So if you have, you know, if you're pregnant, not a good idea. If you're breastfeeding, not a good idea. If you have an eating disorder or have had an eating disorder, it might be something you want to not consider because, you know, it can trigger psychologically the idea that, you know, body image. So it's not done for weight loss. It's done to improve yourself at a cellular level. So little like kids who are growing teenagers, they shouldn't be doing long-term fast because they need more energy, you know, the good type to really build muscle and, and grow taller. Then I tell people, look, don't go tomorrow and say, I'm going to do a seven day fast because it's going to be one of the more painful experiences of your life. Start off slow. So start off with intermittent fasting. I think intermittent fasting or alternate day fasting is one of the best things you can do to not only improve insulin sensitivity, to decrease your glucose load, um, but also to get you into the mindset of I'm not always thinking about food, right? Because I don't know how you were, but for me, one of the biggest benefits was getting out of the idea that I always have to be eating or I'm always thinking about food. When you're in ketosis, real ketosis, you don't, you're not controlled by food, right? Mm -hmm. And that's extremely powerful. And I think until you get back to that state where you know what it feels like to not always be hungry or thinking about food, you can't understand what it feels like anymore. It's the same idea that like I tell people, when you switch over to a ketogenic way of eating and then you go and you have a cheat day, let's say, and you feel miserable, you probably feel a lot worse than you normally did because you don't remember what it felt like to feel good. And so now that you feel good, you get all those symptoms again. Same thing with fasting. You want to take it slow. So start off intermittent fast, you know, maybe do a 24 hour fast, maybe do a three day fast. Um, I personally do 24 hour fast five days a week. And then on the weekends, I'll usually kind of liberalize a little bit. And then I'll do an extended fast uh, every three months. So usually five days. Um, and that's just more of the longevity to make sure that I'm, I'm regenerating cells um, and being as productive as possible. Nice. So. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, everything you said, um, uh, one of the, probably the biggest surprises for me was, you know, I thought before I was a foodie and it mm -hmm. was just, food obsessed because I was, you know, constantly hungry. Right. And sure. it, that's one of the things that, you know, my clients say they enjoy the most is just that freedom. They're no longer obsessed and controlled by food. And I, yeah, I naturally fall into the intermittent fasting. I probably, I mean, at least 18 hours a day. Um, and I do find, yeah, the 24 hour, or, you know, 23 hour daily fast mm -hmm. to be pretty um, empowering as well. I've done two three day fasts in my, my time in ketosis as well. And, and it's so interesting because for me, the first night is the hardest. That's when I'm sure. kind of the hungriest. And it's just the most fascinating thing that the longer you go, the less hungry you are. So we were talking about yeah. that before and like, you know, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? It seems like, you know, if back in the day when we were trying to find food that if you didn't go without food, it seems like you naturally would just want to be focused on food. But it's, it's very fascinating that the longer you go, the less hungry you are. Yeah, I think from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense because I think, and obviously this is all speculation, but imagine like they would go and kill an animal and eat, you know, heart content. Well, if they weren't able to adapt where they could go periods of time without eating, I mean, it's not that easy probably to, to kill a deer here and there or a bear or whatever they were killing. So they had to just, from an evolutionist standpoint, be able to go long periods of time without thinking about food. And when your main macronutrient is protein and fat and not refined carbohydrates, you know, you're not 
getting into the cycle of the insulin glucose kind of cycle that most people are in where you have, you know, big glucose spike. So that's followed by a big insulin spike and then your glucose crashes and your brain is saying, Hey, I'm starving. You need to eat whatever you can find. Being the way that we are in, in strict ketosis, your brain is getting ketones as energy. Your, your organs are getting fatty acids preferentially as energy and some ketones and you're still using some glucose. So there is a fallacy that if you're in ketosis, you're not using glucose, not at all. You're using both. And it's not like the body prefers one over the other. It'll use whatever is available. I think what's happened is that our, the way that we are in a Western society, the predominant is all glucose, right? Or, and fructose. And so our body doesn't know how to adapt to that. And so it's constantly saying signals that, you know, I am hungry because overall they're getting calorie consumption, but the hormonal regulation isn't there, right? And so that's, I think, what people don't understand is that you can eat a whole bunch of food, still be hungry because hormonally you're still having signals saying, I am hungry. You need to feed me, feed my belly. And uh, so I, it makes sense to me evolutionary wise, I think. Oh, hello, kitty. <laughs> well, like we're talking about too, and anybody who's fasted has noticed that just heightened uh, yeah. mental clarity too, which makes sense that then if the beast was walking by, you could focus on killing it instead of like going, right. oh, I'm so hungry, I can't do anything. Exactly, exactly. And interestingly enough, there are some studies that are looking at this where, you know, the, just the idea that I'm going to start eating actually does ramp up your glucose level. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and it's almost, and your ketones. So it's almost like to heighten you that, okay, now I need to go kill something, um, which I think is fascinating. But it makes perfect sense. I don't think we would have survived because we didn't have, you know, fast food at every corner. Um, so it was kind of evolutionary wise, we had to. Well, along the same lines of like what makes sense. I mean, fasting is, is a controversial topic in the, in the keto world. And, um, you know, I'm of the perspective of, you know, we've got people out there that say like the, you should never go more than 12 hours without eating because then you start breaking down all your proteins and you're losing muscle mass. But I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me that the body was designed to, to never be able to go without food. Like it just doesn't make any sense to me, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea that if you go extended periods of time, like sure, if you're going to fast for 30 days, yeah, you're going to lose protein. Are you going to lose the amount that they say you are? No. But if you go for a short period of time, you are not losing protein. So, you know, even if you're in the best keto adapted state, you still have glycogen stores. You're still burning through your glycogen stores. And it's beneficial in a way because what happens? Well, you need to burn through those energy stores in order to actually access your own fat stores. You don't just go straight to the fat. And so a lot of people are actually replenishing those glycogen stores because they're consuming so much in terms of fat in terms of protein. And, and so they never actually break it down. And so they don't actually lose weight, which is what they want to have happen. You do lose protein on extended fast, sure, but you're not going to lose it to the extent that people are concerned about unless you're doing, you know, extreme starvation, uh, basically fasting for extended period of time, which I don't recommend anybody does. I, I think the, the benefit that you get really goes down after five days. I don't see much in terms of you know, your risk to reward ratio. The other thing that people get concerned about is electrolyte imbalances and something called refeeding syndrome. And I've heard this quite a bit. So basically with refeeding syndrome, this happens mostly in people who are very, very sick in the hospital and ICU status who basically are so malnourished that when you start feeding them again, you get a huge electrolyte shift. And so you can get potassium shifts, which can cause arrhythmias where you could theoretically die. But to extrapolate that to somebody who's healthy, doing a three-day water and electrolyte fast is a big stretch. And so I think that's something I see a lot on the internet. Well, if you do it, you're going to die because you're going to have an arrhythmia and, and die from that. I mean, they're not equating the two. And I think that's important to understand too. You, you, uh, answer a question that I had. So our, <laughs> I'm our, reading your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Our friend, Mike Berta actually asked me that in, on his fast. So he's doing his first uh, fast we talked about. So he's on day three, I think four, okay. what is it 60 hours? He's on into day four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go Mike. Yeah. So he, um, 
he says he just he was only going to do 48 hours two days to start with and he just felt so good he's like i'm just going to keep going and so that was his question was you know where's that point of diminishing returns with fasting and you answered that as you know five days after that it's, yeah and and to be honest with you it'd be hard to find studies that say you know there's a diminishing return just from experience i would say after five days especially if you're on the leaner side you know mike's pretty lean at this mm-hmm. point um you know there's really not that much more benefit yeah. in terms of longevity are you going to lose more fat yeah sure i mean you can expect on an average day to lose about half a pound of fat if you're fasted and your glycogen stores are depleted so i mean that's kind of a rough estimate so yeah i mean if you continued you would probably lose more fat but that's not the point the point is you really want to kind of regenerate your system and then also I think for a lot of people, the experience of actually doing a fast is scary, right? It's the unknown. I don't know how I'm going to feel. And once you have done it and have gotten experience from it, it's a lot easier to do it again. So I usually tell people start off slow, do, you know, three days, stop, pat yourself on the back. If you didn't make three days, it's not the end of the world. It's not a competition. Just now you kind of know what to expect. And as you mentioned for you, you know, okay, the first day is going to be really rough for me. But after that, I'm pretty good. Well, it's different for everybody. So. Yeah, and definitely, yeah. It, it's a psychological game. The more times you do yeah, it, it's not, not, it's not as hard. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, let's not paint a rosy picture either. It's not like panacea the whole time, like you're just hanging out, chilling. No, you, you go through some periods where you're like, okay, I need to eat something, but I'm not going to because I want to, I know that it's going to pass, right? So you get bursts of, signals that tell you hey you probably should eat something if you just let it go calm down for a minute have some salt have some water it tends to go away and you don't know that unless you've experienced it before Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of also the muscle memory from experience which helps as well yeah brain brain muscles (laughs) yes big brain muscles all right i think we uh i think we've got as much out of that fasting topic for now as we can but okay what are what are some of your other favorite um you know biohacks that you do with your your patient clients do you, do you call them patients since you go and see them can you call them patients or you call yeah them i just say i say friends, friends clients yeah you know i think um there's a lot of them so it it depends on on what the goal is but i can tell you some of the ones that i think are are very important so and they're simple and and my thing is also I want to make it so that it's accessible to everybody. So I think one of the issues in the biohacking community is that in order to be the healthiest person imaginable, you need to have a you know $50,000 machine that shoves oxygen up your nose. Hey, if you have $50,000 that does that, um, you know, more power to you. But most people that I interact with don't. And so what else can you do to actually get as much benefit out of it without having to spend that money? So simple things like sleep, right? So I talk about sleep a lot, probably put people to sleep when I talk about it, but you know, like sleep is so important. I mean, anybody who's had, you know, restless nights, I mean, I don't know if you remember when you had a young baby and you're not sleeping. Oh no, my son was perfect. He slept great. Okay. Well, your son was perfect, but let me tell you, my kids, (laughs) when it comes to sleep, they're perfect, except when it comes to sleep. So, um, (laughs) you know, and I have three, so inevitably one is up, right? And so you, you have this cortisol rush, which really impacts your ability to control your glucose and your hunger uh, levels, which really affects people in ways that I think is underestimated. And so a lot of times people will plateau or have that little pouch, you know, around the belly that they just can't get rid of. And so we'll start focusing on, okay, well, look, let's look at your sleep patterns. And now with the benefit of technology, we can actually track that. We can look and say, oh, okay, this is what's happening. You're not getting the quality of sleep that you want. You know, the, the negative side of technology and the head of Apple just came out with this was that we are all addicted to our iPhones or Androids or whatever phone you use, but we are addicted mm-hmm. as a society to it. And so how many people, you know, before you go to bed, you're checking your phone, right? Checking that last Instagram post. How many people liked it? Well, that has a negative effect on melatonin production. And as you get older, your melatonin production gets worse. And I'm sure with your history, your melatonin production is not very good. So what can we do to improve the melatonin production? You could take melatonin, 
but then you're suppressing your own melatonin production. So simple things, you know, keeping the room really dark, not being on your iPhone, iPad, TV, a couple hours before you go to bed, you know, read a book, talk to your spouse, um, not eating late at night. So if you eat late at night, it actually suppresses melatonin production in the pancreas, which is fascinating. So focusing on sleep is huge. Um, I'm a big proponent of exercise, but not like, okay, I spent three hours in the gym. I actually prefer that more people work out outdoors, like functional movement, right? So not everybody wants to be huge. The people who do, you know, more power to you. But really focusing on exercise and muscle is important because it does a lot of things from a hormonal standpoint, right? So you improve insulin sensitivity. You increase the amount of glucose receptors. So you, when you're eating something, you drive the glucose into the muscles where they actually need them, right? We got to get away from glucose is the worst thing ever. It is when it's in excess, but you actually need it for functions. So what can you do to improve the absorption and the utilization of glucose? Well, muscle mass will do that. So lifting weights is important. Even if you're doing your own body weight, that's important. You know, I think a lot of people that I work with who are females are worried, well, I'm going to get huge. I'm going to get jacked. Trust me, it t- it's going to take a lot of work to get that. Doing, you know, lady push-ups or real push-ups or functional movement is not going to get you huge. You're just going to get, actually, you're going to lose body fat. So that's important. Um, I do a lot of cold water stuff. Which oh, Yeah. Is- yeah, a ton of cold water. I mean, myself, I do it, you know, five, six times a week. Cold water immersion um, is tremendous. I'm going to be giving a talk at KetoCon in a couple of weeks. I'll be talking about it. But um, you, you can really increase your metabolic rate and you can increase the thermodynamically active fat cells in your body, which are called brown fat or brown adipose tissue, which actually give off heat because... If they're, they're there to actually keep you from getting uh, hypothermia. So like little babies, when they come out, they have a lot of brown fat. So that's why they don't shiver all the time. You would imagine they're always naked. Well, they don't shiver because they have brown fat and that brown fat is burning energy to keep them warm. As adults, we thought that we got rid of that brown fat, but we actually have it. We just don't activate it because we're never cold, right? We're always in 72 degree weather, maybe not in Seattle, but we're always, you know, in perfectly conditioned, you know. Today it is. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. See? So. One day. So, yeah. But if you, you know, get outside in the cold, you know, jump in a lake or do an ice bath or just do a cold shower, you're going to start maybe activating some of that and, and benefit yourself from a hormonal perspective, but also from a, a fat loss perspective. Um, same thing with sauna work, you know jumping in a sauna, UV sauna, or just a regular sauna, tremendous benefits and, um, you know, improves norepinephrine production. It, it really does a number of things from a hormonal perspective that I think really augments the ability to, to lose real fat, which is what most people want, but also improve longevity, which is, you know, from my perspective as a physician, I look at this more as how am I going to improve people's lives, their longevity, get rid of health issues that they have, and yeah, weight loss will come off, but but to me, that's a side effect of everything that we're focusing on. And um, I think if more people start thinking of it that way, we'll make a lot more um, progress. So just as simple as like a you know cold finish on your shower, right? You're not talking about like going and buying a tub and keeping it cold. And well, so again, it's one of those things where if you look at the research you have to hit a threshold in terms of cold water. So okay. the cold water shower, like at the end of a shower is really to get you used to the idea of being cold. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, if you do 30 seconds with cold water at the end of a you know, cold water shower at the end of your shower, you're not really going to activate the, the brown fat. You need to be in cold water. So less than 60 degrees, you know, alternatively you can do cryotherapy, which is, you know, gaining popularity where it's, you know, very, very cold, 120 degrees negative, and, but you do it for three minutes. So it's more tolerable, but not everybody wants, you know, wants to or can spend 60 bucks a pop or whatever it is. So that's why I do the poor man's version, which is just ice bath. I got a better idea. I got an even easier Tell version. Me. Tell me. Go, go to one of the uh, warehouse type stores and go. Go stand in their cooler for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking for some ice and it's, just sit out on one of the, you know, the heavy cream pallets and just chill right. out. 
<laughs> we're going to be arrested. People are going to say, yeah, I heard this doctor said, you know, just go in the ice cooler and, and I froze to death. So no, don't do that. It's, well, it's really interesting to me because after my, like, uh, you know, for people listening that don't know my history yeah. of traumatic brain injury after a car accident, what I've noticed since then is that my tolerance for being in that cold environment, and it, that's why it popped in my mind because specifically like going to a warehouse store where I have to walk into the cooler or whatever, yeah. like I, it, it makes me feel really, um, really lightheaded and uneasy. Yep. And yep. so there's something about my activation of, you know, whatever part of my brain that's sensing that cold that it kind of, it still freaks it out. So I don't have a very um, tolerance for like a, a total immersion of cold like that. It's really interesting to me because before yeah. that, like I didn't have anything like that. I was actually enjoyed cold so yeah one of the things that i find really fascinating about traumatic brain injuries or strokes or anything where it's really the brain has been affected it's pretty common that extremes of anything are difficult to um, manage right so really really hot really really cold um, because i think your brain because of the trauma that it's had doesn't have the ability to auto kind of control itself as well as somebody who doesn't. And then we see that a lot with blood pressure management for people who have had strokes or internal bleeding in the brain um, or traumatic brain injuries. It's very, very difficult to control because the body, the brain is just not where it normally was. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised um, that you would have that reaction. I think, you know, most people, I recommend they start slow. So very simple, like dunk your face in, in ice in a sink, you know, get used to that feeling of just, I want to be, you know, cold, you know, don't go and jump in, in the lake that's 20 degrees, you know, day one and say, Hey, he told me to do it. No, that's stupid. Just build up to it. Like anything else, build up to it. And again, the only thing I would say is that you could do all these biohacks and then go out and, you know, go to fast food and eat crap food it's not gonna do much for you, right? So you gotta focus on the nutrition first and then build these things in to really kind of augment what you're doing. Um, and so that's kind of what, what I tell people. It's, it makes me think of, um, you know, you've got a lot of people out there, they're trying to out supplement a bad diet, right? Yep. There's all this long list of supplements and then because they're actually following a diet that's actually the most healthful. The same thing, you can't biohack your way out of a bad lifestyle. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I, I think that's hilarious. I see that a lot where it's like, well, I'm taking, you know, 10 supplements, but, you know, my food doesn't have any nutrients in it. You know, I'm a, you know, I'm a big proponent of supplements to augment what I'm doing with food. That's the way yeah. I put it. So, yeah. yeah. And I Absolutely. found, I found for most people just getting on a ketogenic or low carb diet that 90% of the other supplements they were taking are just totally unnecessary. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of those things are not regulated, so they could have whatever they want in it. A lot of them have sugar, maldextrin, you know, fillers that actually could be pro-inflammatory. So you might actually be doing yourself a disservice by taking them. Now, having said that, there's some very good ones out there that I do recommend people take. Um, but in addition to, you know, changing their diet to more of a low carb and ketogenic. Um, and the other thing just on that on that message is that I don't think everybody needs to be hardcore ketogenic all the time. I don't. I think if you're doing it for a therapeutic reason, you've had a brain injury, you have epilepsy, you have cancer, you know, you, you are metabolically damaged, meaning you have insulin resistance, type two diabetes. Then I think it's important to do very, very strict ketogenic diet because you can reverse a lot of those kind of uh, maladies. But for people who are like just young and healthy, no, I don't think you have to be in streak ketosis all the time. I think it's a good idea to cycle through. So I think you have to also take it, you know, with that big picture as well. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Um, all right. Any other biohacks you like to use? What about, you know, how much time do we have? Cause I have a ton of <laughs> food blockers and, uh, you know, the, yeah, yeah. It's called the Himalayan, uh, ice, uh, or the oh, you have one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do a lot of things. Um, and, and I always kind of preface it as, okay, I always look at things more from a perspective of, okay, is this safe? So am I going to tell people to do something that's really dangerous? If it's dangerous, then I'm not going to tell people to do it. I might try it myself, but I won't tell people. And then is there any benefit from it, right? And so like the Himalayan salt, yeah, I think it's great. So at night, 
instead of having halogen lights that are mostly blue, blue light dominant, having a halogen light that number one gives you like that incandescent light bulb, which doesn't have a lot of blue light, but number two, it actually gives you off ions that can help with, you know, melatonin production and sleep. Um, you know, I turn off all the major lights in my house starting at seven. We have different lights that are only basically amber or like the Himalayan salt lamps. You know, I do like essential oil, lavender to try to help, you know, calm me down at night. Um, what else do I do? I do too many things. I forgot about them. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, meditation I'm working on. Um, I think it's really hard uh, for me. And I think everybody has like their own one that's really, really hard. And they're like, oh, I can't do it. So they don't focus on it. I've tried to start focusing on the things that are really hard for me to do. So, so that one is really hard. I do a lot of photobiomodulation. So, you know, we've been telling people for a long time that you shouldn't have sun exposure. And we've done that to the detriment of people, right? Wow. And so especially in like, you know, northern parts of the country, like where you are, you know, you'll go months without really, really good sun exposure. Well, there's a lot of negative side effects from that, right? So, I mean, seasonal uh, affective disorder is very big in those parts of the country. Well, a lot of that's because you're not getting sun exposure. Well, you could do that with an artificial sun, right? So you can get some photobiomodulation machines. There's a couple out there. There's more coming which I'm excited about because it's dropping the price. So a lot of more people can afford it. So I do that every morning. I get good amount of sun or UVA, UVB exposure. Um, my vitamin D levels through the roof because of it. I don't need to supplement. Um, I do a lot of things on circadian rhythm where our body, each organ has its own circadian rhythm and we got to stay within that kind of normal pattern, right? Well, with the way that we live, most people can't do that because we wake up, it's dark, we go to work, we're indoors all day. So our body has no idea if it's daytime, nighttime, you know, like when you travel and you, and you get that jet lag and you're up and it's two in the morning and you have no idea where you are. Well, a lot of people's bodies are always like that. And what, we, what do we do? Well, we supplement. So we say, okay, let's have some caffeine in the morning to get going, right? And then we take some some wine or, or, you know, alcohol at night to pass out or we take sleeping pills to pass out. That's because our body doesn't know where, where we're at. And so you can reset that by doing simple things, right? Either, <laughs> you know, get some sun exposure in the morning, go outside, have your lunch middle of the day. So at noon, your body knows it's like supposed to be outside. And then at night kind of turn off those devices, turn off those lights so that um, you, your body knows it's time time to go to bed. Yeah, it's interesting. I never really even thought about my own biohacking that I've done, but like mm -hmm. a lot of what you were just talking about is all that I that, uh, that I incorporate in my life. So, yeah, I mean, seasonal You're affective. A biohacker. There you yeah, go. yeah. See, seasonal affective disorder is no joke up here in the Seattle area, yeah, and I gotta right. say, like, sadly, like almost every year around February. Uh, you know, another person or somebody else related to somebody else I know that, that commits suicide because yeah. of the depression up here. And so it's just, it's terribly sad. And I know Rob Wolf, um, he's of the mindset that like nobody should live up here. Like this should just be turned back into <laughs> rainforest, that nobody should live up here. And well, we're going to all be concentrated in like one little spot that has. Right, we're all going to move to Reno with him, right? Yeah, yeah. All yeah. right, Rob, we're coming. Yeah, we're coming Can to I Lake crash at your Ridge. Place? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, what I've found and, you know, my family has a really strong history of, of, uh, you know, seasonal depression or just depression yep. in general. Right. And, you know, keto took away most of that, but what I've added onto that is that, you know, I've got the bright light box over here that I put yep. on daylight hours. Um, Good. and I've, I've, um, you know, I've got this, you know, I've got flux on my computer. So it, yep. you know, the, yep. the blue and red light come with the natural um, rhythms I live in a house with a lot of light and skylight and things like that. And, yeah. um, and that's really helped, but also and the you have plants, too. plants. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, my office that I spend most of my day in, I created it like a tropical oasis was the, the theme that I have in here so that it's, I love it reminds it. me of bright, sunny places. Um, I As travel. You can tell, I did the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like yellow, like Cuba right there. Right. Well, I'm traveling right now. So this is oh, a, okay. Yeah, hotel um, ambiance. It's 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 really nice. You, you <laughs> yeah. try it. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and then the other thing I've added this last year is actually tanning bed, which you know is really controversial. But 
you know, I, I travel frequently as I can to sunny places, but it's not enough to go like a couple of weeks to sunny right. places. And so I've added the, the tanning bed and it's been, you know, probably three days a week I'll go and, and get the full, you know, the, the bad yep. ones with the UVB because that's yep. what's going to create the, the, you know, the, the cancer cells. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, well, I was going to say the vitamin D, but yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's made a huge difference. Like it's been, I, you know, I feel really great. And, um, you know, I too as well, like in the evening, turn off all lights, you know, when the sun goes right. down, turn off all our official lights and have like a special orange light in my, my room. And, you know, the only devices I'm looking at have like the flux on it as right. well to get that too. So those are all the things that I've done um, personally for biohacking and I never even thought about them that way. So um, it's, there it's, you are. You're, uh, you're, you're yeah. not going to be keto Carol anymore. You're going to be a biohacker Carol. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I did last year as well for further healing for my brain stuff as I did some uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy nice. and IV nutrient therapy as well, which, cause I was having um, last year, one of the residual other things going on with the brain injury were, was central sleep apnea, which is very different than um, right. obstructive apnea. And everybody I reached out to, they were like, oh yeah, that's a tough one. Nobody had any ideas. And so <laughs> the, the hyperbaric oxygen worked really well for that. So that resolved that. So um, I've got yeah. some, you know, I'm, I'm inspired now to perhaps get back on doing some, uh, some adding some fasting in and things like that i've talked to you you're, you're the fasting inspiration or apparently apparently yeah i mean i'm gonna start, start a trend a seattle fasting club there you go Oh, okay there we go no, yeah right. <laughs> i'm still, I'm well, still no. writing the, the higher protein uh biohack that i've been enjoying for um it's been doing well at kind of taking off some extra um subcutaneous fat for me and i i really need to check my insulin again to see how that's affected yeah that. Well, so that's, I'm, I'm riding that train right now. And then after I, I, that train comes to a, a <laughs> nice landing, I'll, I'll jump on the, the fasting. I think the fasting. Well. Yeah. You go from protein, you're going to build muscle yeah. and then you're going to fast and you're going to lose it all. So <laughs> <laughs> all of it. I'll just be all like, a pile of you're just going to melt into a puddle of just skin. So yeah, make sure yeah. you bulk up on the <laughs> protein. Um, yeah. yeah, no, no. And I think it, what I like is that in the community is that people are open to trying things, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm open-minded enough to say, okay, let's see what this big protein thing is about, right? Because a lot of people are coming to me and saying, hey, I want to do, you know, this amount of protein. Well, let's, let's look at it. Let's try it. Let's see what it does. I can tell you my experience. I can tell you what I look at the research, what it says. But I'm also open-minded uh, enough to say, you know what? Okay, maybe we need to increase your protein a little bit, you know? I'll give it to you. Ted, you know, is very, very convincing. He's got some good studies and I mean, you know, he's Jack, so more power to him. He's ripped um, and Jack. <laughs> ripped and Jack, right? He came out that way and he stayed that way his whole life. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I, and I think if we can get as a community where we are not going after each other and instead we're actually kind of building each other up and saying, okay, let's talk about it. Let's have a discussion. I, I don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with that. But when it gets to like entrenched where it's like my way or the, or the highway, then I think we're doing a disservice to the whole community in general. And uh, we don't need to do that. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I love the most about going to these different conferences in this mm -hmm. community is that together face to face, everybody's very collaborative. And, you know, we yep. can get stuck in our own little world and social media and argue about who's right and wrong. But when we come together, we're having really great discussions and people yep. are open to learning from everyone and everyone's inspired from everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's great. I mean, you know, social media is good in the sense that, you know, it connects you with people, but there's the downside where it's like anonymous people who are just trying to bring you down. So I like the in-person. I'm, I'm old school. I like in-person connections. Yeah. And um, so I really enjoyed meeting you and a whole bunch of people on the cruise. Yeah, me too. I appreciate it so much. Yeah. It was, yeah. I felt very lucky and grateful that I got to sit at the table that I did. the. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I just kind of wrapping this up, like, was there anything else that you wanted to, you know, talk about here at the end or anything else you're hoping to cover? I mean, I'm sure we could have you get back on 10 more times. Yeah. After things to talk about but. well i mean i think you know we could always go into like more specifics about biohacks and like how to implement it i kind of gave you like the overall quick abridged version like the cliff note version um but if you're ever interested in more like the science behind it and um kind of like the how to implement it i think you know my takeaway for most people would be 
start with your nutrition, you know, figure out, like use macros initially to give yourself a, an idea of where you're at. Count, you know, the calories you're consuming and the, and the ratios initially. But don't be obsessed about it. Don't try to hit your macros by adding, you know, liquid oils. Don't do that. That's not, that's not the purpose. Start with real food, whether it's paleo, keto, low carb, high fat, whatever it is, start with real food and good quality food if you can afford it. And then from there, you can start, start tinkering with it because a lot of people will say, well, I tried keto. It didn't work for me. Well, yeah, because you probably didn't do something right. Right. So you probably thought you were doing it in the, in the correct version and you weren't. So don't give up figure out what wasn't working and start tinkering with it and get more knowledge like, you know, from people like yourself so that you can implement it for a lifelong kind of regeneration. This is lifelong. This is not a diet. It's not a fad. Do something that's going to work for you to keep you healthy the rest of your life. So you don't have to see people like me. So you don't have to see doctors. <laughs> your I mean, goal is to work yourself out of a job, right? We will always have, you know, <laughs> jobs. I, I'm not concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is how do we as a society change the direction that we're going? Because, you know, you and I know this and, and people around us know this, but I look around and I see a population that has no idea what's coming, especially with the children. I mean, children uh, are, you know, the obesity rates in children are going astronomical and we are not doing anything to change that if anything it's getting worse or being stagnant and so if that continues i don't know what we're going to do as a society because they're going to be very unhealthy for the rest of their lives so that's my biggest concern yeah yeah all right well i really appreciate you coming on and yeah thank you hours flown by and you know if you've watched my episodes you know my <laughs> closing question uh <laughs> bring it your last, your last day on earth is today. Uh, the meteors is coming. It's going to wipe us all out. Yes. Uh, what's, what's your final meal? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a depressing question, <laughs> but, uh, mine would be surrounded by friends and family. Oh, I love that. Nobody yeah. said that part of it. So I would want to be around everybody that I love and, um, it would be kind of like a, a potluck of every like favorite thing that I've ever eaten. And I would want like people to bring their favorite dish. So it wouldn't be just like one thing that I would eat. It would just be more the community and be, being surrounded by people that I love. Um, so if I had to say like, okay, one meal, it would be some big Alaskan sockeye salmon. Oh. Like, you know, cook well with a big salad, avocados, olives olive oil um probably some really good cheese since i don't eat cheese that much anymore <laughs> um yeah pretty simple well, i pretty love simple. i love your answer so much because that's it's it's so um appropriate for a biohacking physician to think about the whole environment of the food and not just the food. So yeah. I love that. So unique and very different than anybody else has said before. So that's great. All I love right. it. I'm a, I'm I'm a answer, rare butterfly. I'm the best answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, you win for, for now. So somebody else next <laughs> well, year, well, you better try harder. <laughs> oh yeah. They better try hard. That was a good one. All right. <laughs> well, thanks Kara. I really had a good time and I uh, look forward to doing more in the future and, and seeing you at some of these crazy conferences. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if you guys enjoyed this, give us a thumbs up. Uh, share this with people you, you think will be, um, you know, benefit from this information. Subscribe if you want to see more. I've got lots of great more, lots of great more. Lots of more great, <laughs> and, and awesome interviews with bonus cat pop-ups in them as well. Yes. And yes. Um, thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.